Let's pray together. Lord, uh, thank you, God, for the cross. Thank you for what you um, did for each one of us in expressing your love in such a clear, powerful way, God. And we thank you, Lord, that we live on this side of the cross, that um, that road to the cross went through the cross and went to an empty tomb. And we cherish the cross all that much more because you are not just a Savior who is willing to die for us, but you are the Lord who conquered the grave. And today, God, we are grateful for this privilege to be here. Thank you for the opportunity to worship. Thank you for the opportunity to be together, friends, those who um, many have invested in our lives, are investing in our lives. We're grateful, Lord, for the privilege. Um, today, Lord, we, we just ask that your spirit might speak to our spirit. We, we open our hearts. We open our lives. We pray that you uh, would take your word and empower it by your spirit and speak deeply into our hearts. And I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, it is great to be here with you today. And uh, Dr. Kelly, thank you for the opportunity to be here and uh, just the, the privilege to, to come and to share with you in chapel. Um, I also want to thank uh, some of these guys who came with me uh, from, from uh, the church that I, I pastor in, in Madison. And uh, they are a blessing to me. And um, I, I told them David Platt was preaching today. And so they're a little disappointed right now. But... Um, it's okay. They can watch podcasts later. No, uh, they, they actually knew, and, uh, and I, I, them coming. I'm, I'm glad you're here today. Um, I, I'm, I'm grateful that you took time today to, to stop and to pause. Um, it's been several years since I've had the privilege to be in chapel, but I remember so many times I came to chapel um, really dry, really um, maybe discouraged, maybe struggling. I, I, I'll have to say there were times that in chapel I was studying uh, Hebrew vocabulary notes or uh, uh, other things, and there were things I, I had on my mind. But, but when I came, it, inevitably, I, I don't remember a time uh, that I ever came to chapel that God did not in some way speak a truth into my heart and life that I needed at that moment. And my prayer for you today, as I've been praying, God, what, what would you have me to say? It's just uh, a few minutes that we have together. Uh, we may know each other. We may not know each other. We may see each other again. We may not see each other again. But God, that you would have us to look in your word and to know together in these few moments that we have. And, and I, I, I thought about this. I, I want to share with you the most important verse I learned in seminary. Um, it, it's a simple verse, and today maybe you can memorize it with me. It's a, just a simple verse found in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 24. 1 Thessalonians 5, 24. You can open your Bible there if you'd like, but, but I, I want you just to, to listen to the verse. This is it. It's just three simple phrases. It's a part of that, uh, that concluding part of the, uh, of the book, uh, the letter of, of, of 1 Thessalonians, where Paul almost has these sentence sermons, words like, Pray without ceasing. Don't quench the spirit. These uh, rejoice always. These simple little phrases that, that Paul just in a, almost a staccato type way uh, is, is allowing the Holy Spirit to share through him with others. In 1 Thessalonians 5.24 says it this way. I memorized it in the King James, and so that's the way I want to just share it with you this morning. The first time I read it, it was these simple three little phrases. Faithful is he who calls you, who also will do it. Faithful is he who calls you, who also will do it. I love those words because when, when, I, when I found them, I was in need not so much of a sermon or a lesson, though all of those things, the, the things I learned at seminary and, and, and the, my opportunity to study and my, my uh, graduate work and my doctoral work, there were so many things God taught me through gifted and godly men and women who taught me the Word and opened the Word and taught me theology and church history, education and counseling. I would have paid a 
a little more attention in counseling if I'd known how much of that I was going to have to do. But uh, sometimes people come to me for counseling, and I want to tell them, i got to see in counseling. Do you really want to listen to me? But anyway, that's a whole other thing. But, but, but the, the, the thing that, that I learned uh, uh, at this moment, faithful is he who calleth you who also will do it. I didn't need a lesson that day. I didn't need a sermon. What I needed that day was an encounter with God. Have you ever been at that place? You, you, you have almost too many lessons. I mean, they're, they're papers to write and, and tests that are coming up, and, and, and you've got knowledge just, just coming out everywhere. I mean, you're, you're overwhelmed with knowledge, and yet knowledge doesn't seem to do it. And it's not just a sermon that you need. Though, though those, are, those are so good. You need an encounter with God. Like the Emmaus disciples. I was reading the, the whole Easter story, and last week, here we are, just four days removed from Easter. It seems like a distant memory now. But, but, but four days removed, we live, though, though we live in the power of the resurrection, sometimes we just slip away from that event. And here we are, almost like the disciples on the road to Emmaus. We know one of his names. Uh, his name was Cleopas, an unfortunate name, but uh, I don't know what it means. I'm sure it means something like blessed of God, but uh, Cle Cleopas and his friend, and they were, while all of the, the action was happening in Jerusalem, you remember that? There was all this word. In fact, this stranger joined them as they were walking along, and, and he says, hey guys, what are you talking about? It was Jesus, and they just didn't realize it. And, and it says they were downcast. They were discouraged. They were in the wrong direction. They were not going toward Jerusalem. They were going away from Jerusalem on their way to Emmaus. Instead of going and running to an empty tomb and, and looking and searching for the risen Lord, they were walking away from all the action, and they were down. They said, Don't, are you a stranger to Jerusalem, and you haven't heard? Jesus of Nazareth, who is mighty indeed. We, we thought he was the Messiah. And our high priest, they've, they've given him over. And they've crucified him. And he was buried. And he said three days later he would be raised to life. And it's three days later, and they've come from the tomb, and the tomb is empty. It, did, did you get, they had all of the right information. They weren't lacking infor information. What they were lacking in their life was the inspiration that comes in believing what they earned. And Jesus said, oh, you who are foolish and slow of heart to believe. And he begins to unfold to them even more information. He, he started with, the, with, with Moses and then went through the prophets. Can you imagine what that, that must have? I wish I could have been there just uh, walking along with Jesus and these two disciples as he starts with, with, with uh, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, the, the Moses. And then he moves into the prophets and he he says, guys, don't you understand? And they didn't. And it was not until later at the table they got to the place they were going and they said, Jesus, would you stay with us? They didn't know his name. Would you just stay with us? Could you keep teaching us? Could you keep telling us? And there they sat down at dinner and you remember what happened? He broke bread and suddenly it was, it was like a trigger moment in their hearts and lives. All of the information came alive as they suddenly, their eyes were open and they realized, this is Jesus. And he, he vanished at that moment. And they got up and they walked back the seven miles to Jerusalem and walked back and said, hey, we've, we've, we've seen him. He is alive. He is risen. And they said, it's just like he told us. And, and remember what they said, my, how our hearts burned within us as we walked along the way. They didn't need another sermon. They needed an encounter with the living Christ. Faithful is he who calls you, who also will do it. I want just to walk through those verses real quickly, if you would, with me, or those phrases. The first one, faithful is he. The word in the Greek is literally faithful. It's just faithful. You fill in the blank. He is faithful, the faithfulness of God in our life. 
I would suggest to you that the, that phrase, faithful is he, describes the power that is behind us. The power that backs us up. The power that is within us, certainly through the power of the Holy Spirit, but the power of God, His faithfulness that is in each of our lives, day in, day out, from the time the sun comes up to the time the sun goes down, and from the time you go to sleep to the next morning you wake up, He is always there, faithfully giving His love, faithfully giving His grace, faithfully giving His power to all those who are seeking Him. Faithful is He. Today, some of you may have walked in and you just need to be reminded of the power that is behind you, his faithfulness. I mean, we see his faithfulness just in this room today, what God has brought this seminary family through in the, the years of Katrina, the faithfulness of God, story after story, moment after moment. And you in this room, you could tell stories about God's faithfulness in your life to this point. Faithful. Is he the faithfulness of God? This morning, I, I hope you will remember that the power that is in our life is, is not the knowledge we attain, it's not the eloquence with which we might hope to speak, it's not, it, it's not our ability to lead in a visionary way. It's not our opportunity to exercise our giftedness even. Those are not the greatest points of power for us. The greatest power in our life is the faithfulness of our God. He loves us, and He is faithful. He will never leave us. He will never forsake us. That's something that I think um, is a new well. Thomas Chisholm grew up a young man. He was very sick, and um, in fact, as he grew older, his sickness, he was so sickly that he, he often couldn't go to work, and it was quite a problem because he, he couldn't make ends meet often and couldn't hold down a job, and yet he kept going to the Word, and day after day he would seek the Word. His favorite verse was Lamentations 3, 22 and 23. It is, the Lord's, it is of the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed because His compassions fail not. They are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. And on a mission trip, he sat down and he penned the words to a poem who he sent to a friend, sent to a friend who put it to music. Later it was shared at the Moody Bible Institute. It became the theme song of that institute. And it's the hymn that we all know and we love. Great is thy faithfulness, O Father. There is no shadow of turning with thee. Thou changest not, thy compassions they fail not. We know of his great faithfulness. Great is thy faithfulness. Great is thy faithfulness. Morning by morning do mercies I see. All I have needed thy hand hath provided. We know our God is so faithful. Let me ask you this. Are you in need to rediscover the faithfulness of God this day? He hasn't forgotten you. He is so faithful. But there's the second verse. Faithful is he, the power behind us. But that next passage, that next little phrase, who calls you. The faithfulness of God is the power behind us, but the, the calling of God in our lives is the privilege that is upon us, that God has called us. What a privilege. The God of heaven and earth, the God who created heaven and earth, the God who created you, he created me. His faithfulness to us is extended as by his grace and for his glory he has called us out. What a privilege. He's called us to salvation, to relationship. Relationship with a holy God through the atoning death of his son. He's called us to salvation. He's called us not only to salvation, he's called us to sanctification. In fact, the, the context of this verse, it, it, it's following on the heels of, of, of Paul's prayer, may the God uh, uh, that is, may he sanctify you and keep you until the day that he returns. It, it, it's this beautiful picture of his sanctification that he is working in our lives, working it out in our lives. But there's also, there's also the privilege not only of salvation and sanctification, there's the privilege in our life of service to him. We've been called to serve him. 
What an awesome thing. And ultimately, we've been called to daily surrender to him. Each one of us in our lives. On our way here, I was visiting with um, Drew Chapman. Drew, is, uh, his wife is on our staff and just uh, just awesome, awesome lady. And he is a fine, great guy. And Drew was sharing with, uh, with me about the passion of the Christ. We, uh, Good Friday, we watched that at our, our church. And, and he came and he watched it. He had seen it before he was a Christian several years ago. And then he watched it now that he is a Christian. And he was sharing with his wife, and she shared with me earlier this week. And I said, Drew, just tell me about that. And as I listened to him, it was just awesome to think about. When you stand and you look at the cross, he said, the first time I saw it, it was like watching Braveheart or something like that. But this time when I watched it, I knew that what Christ did, it was for me. It wasn't just a movie. It wasn't just an actor. It was a picture of what Christ had done for me. He calls us out. The privilege that is upon It is the greatest privilege in the world to serve Jesus Christ. We need to be reminded of that. For some of you, right now your calling has, has brought you, your preparation for service has brought you to a place of study. And it's, it's, it's great, but it's, I saw over and over again as a pastor uh, here and uh, to some of the seminary family, I saw people who had been called of God and, and that calling was so real to them and they packed up and they came to New Orleans and they, they, they walked into the seminary and they started classes and somewhere along the way, they lost sight of the privilege that God had given them to be called. Sometimes they would come to my office and say, they were discouraged and I'd say, well, yeah, me too, I'm a student too. Sometimes um, I, 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 they would be overwhelmed by the task, and I'd say, yeah, me too. I, I can remember coming to Edgewater, Dr. Kelly, and, and my first Sunday, I remember um, Dr. Mosley was there with his Hebrew Bible. Uh, Dr. Ray was there with his Greek Bible. Dr. Holcomb, who has the whole Bible memorized, you know, they, they, were, they were all there. And I was thinking, I'm not going to say any word what this means in the Greek or the Hebrew. I was like, I'm not, you know, I was afraid to read the English, you know. And so, um, but, but, I, but I learned there, God taught me there that God had called them and called them to, to teach and to lead and to pastor in different ways. But he had called me. He's called you. The privilege that is yours. Don't, don't waste these precious moments of study. I've had the privilege to, to teach in some places around the world. Togo, West Africa, and the back, back areas of Nicaragua, and the, the areas of Ukraine. And I've seen people who have come, and, and they have, some of them have walked miles to study God's word with someone. Now, I thought about how many times I complained about the opportunity to study instead of just said, God, thank you for the privilege to open your word. It's a privilege. But the bigger picture in your life is not the study. It's how God wants to use your life now and in the days ahead. Faithful is he the power that is behind us, who calls you, the privilege is upon us. There is no greater privilege in all the world than to be a part of the work of the local church, in my, in, in my opinion. To see God at work, to be a part of the Great Commission, to see, see God working in powerful and beautiful ways, the privilege that is ours. Today, I hope you'll be encouraged by that. You'll be reminded of that. But there's the last phrase. Faithful is he, the power behind us, who calls you the privilege upon us. And then that last little phrase, who also will do it. That little indefinite pronoun or indefinite article there, that, that, it's, a, it's a beautiful, beautiful it, just a simple little word but it's filled with great potential. He will do it. I suggest to you, it's possible, that little phrase represents the possibilities ahead of us. 
What does God have in store for you? He also will do it. I can't um, tell you how many times I sat in a chapel service or in a classroom, and I thought, you know, God, I, I don't know if I can do that. The reason this verse is the, the greatest verse I learned in seminary is because I, I found it one day when I was ready to quit. It had been a hard semester. I, was, um, I had the shingles. My grandmother died. Um, it, it's just a it was just a hard semester. I had a child born. Uh, that was a great joy, but I felt the press and the weight of that, financial burdens. And I remember going home at, at Christmas and thought, you know, I'm done. Yeah, I, I saw some friends of mine who were, they, they had gone to college with me and they had their jobs and they were doing great and they had the, the house and all this kind of stuff. And I thought, you know, I, I, we, we can't even squeak out. We God, there have got to be easier ways to make a living. You know? You ever been there? And in my quiet time with God, I was doing a lot wrong. I was whining a lot, to tell you the truth. I, I know God wanted to say, shut up. You know? You know? Just anyway. But I don't know that he would say shut up. But he, he would probably say anyway. So I just found that verse. In my quiet time, that's the one thing I did right. Kept going into the presence of God. It was like that morning, God just spoke to me. It wasn't verse probably out of context, but it was perfect for my context. Rob, I'm faithful, and I've called you, and I'll do it. What is it, God? It's so big, Rob, that if I showed it to you, you would be freaked out. Because it's bigger than you. It requires me. And over and over again, I've seen God do it. This week ought to be called Miracle Week. I asked Dr. Kelly, I said, you know, are you having all the graduates that you didn't think would graduate, you know, or, or at least, you know, one? And, uh, God, God did it. What he led me to, he empowered me for, and he led me ultimately to complete. But he's not through yet. He's not through with you. He'll do it. I don't know what it is, in, but let God lead you. Faithful is he who calls you, who also will do it. My, my dad's a one of my biggest heroes in life. And um, I, I had an experience um, uh, when I was in seventh grade that marked my life. Uh, it's hard to tell now, but when I was in seventh grade, I was not this kind of physical specimen of, um, of athleticism. Um, <laughs> I, was, I was short and chunky then, and not much has changed. But I signed up to run the mile run. And... Um, I started running, and I thought, I've really got a shot at this. Little did I know, that's like the hardest thing to run, and, you know, short, fat guys don't do so well at it. And, um, but my first race, I remember I, I went and signed up, and, man, standing there on the line, I had my uniform on. My dad drove me to me. He was like, you can do this. This is great. The gun went off. I started out of the blocks as fast as I could. I got, I got around the first curve, and I knew I was in trouble. These guys, their legs were longer than my entire body, and they're just outpacing me, stretching way beyond me. By the, by the time we were on the second lap, my goal was not to get lapped. By the third lap, it was not to let everybody lap me, okay? By the fourth lap. I'm just trying to, to, to figure out, can I finish this? I was exhausted. I, I was so far behind the rest of the field, and this is not a lie. They were setting up the hurdles for the next event, okay? So I'm trying to decide, do I hide and act like I'm helping set up the hurdles, 
or do I keep running? You know, what do I do, God? And, and, and so I'm running along, and I'm thinking, this is humiliating. I'm thinking, I hope no girls see me, you know, just maybe I can slink across the, the, the line, and, and, and it'll be okay. And about that time, as I was coming around the corner to the finish line, there standing beside the finish line, I heard a voice first, and then I saw whose voice it was. I recognized it, but there was my dad, and he was saying, Come on! You can do it! Hey, Rob! And I thought, don't say my name! <laughs> Heaven's sake! Come on, Rob! Woo! That's my boy! That's my boy! You can do it, son! Come on! Come on! You can do it! And I was like, this guy's lost his mind. I mean, it, it, was, it was both encouraging and humiliating at the same time. And it, it was one of those moments, if he had had a Coke in his hand, we could have made millions of dollars on the commercial. But, but, but he yelled me over the line. He encouraged me over the line. He reminded me that it didn't matter to him if I was first place or last place. He wanted me to know I was done. He loved me, and he was for me. And there is a heavenly father today who wants you to know he's for you. He has not lost sight of where you are. He's not in the least bit concerned about where you feel like you're finishing the race. He wants you to keep moving forward. Faithful is he who calls you who also will do it. God bless you. Lord, thank you for this day. Thank you for your faithfulness in our life. And God, I thank you for each person that's in this room. Whatever is in front of them, God, you know it. Whatever they're facing, the struggles maybe in their family or in their studies or their churches they're serving, maybe their frustration that they haven't had the opportunity to serve yet uh, in, in, a, in a role that they feel called to, God. I, I just pray, God, that you would speak and take what you have taught me through your word, God. I pray that it might be an encouragement to others in this room. I thank you for your faithfulness. I thank you for your calling. And I thank you for the possibilities that are ahead of us. I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.